welcome everyone to another Night Sky News and the last one of the year somehow as well. I've worn my uh, NASA Christmas jumper for the occasion, which I'm really quite fond of. <laughs> we'll start off by looking at what's in the sky in the coming month and then we'll go on to space news stories of the past month. So if you've clicked on the video for whatever's in the title, the uh, timestamps are all in the description if you want to skip straight to that bit along with all the papers I mentioned as well. But without further ado, let's get into this and start by looking up. So one of my favorite things to do around Christmas time is look for the International Space Station in the sky. And at least in the UK anyway, it's been doing many, many Passovers the past couple of days. Now NASA haven't published the times yet for Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, but I will put the link in the description so that you can see for your specific town or city what time the ISS will be passing over. It's always a great sight to try and spot in the sky. It's incredibly bright, you know, as bright as Venus, so you're not going to miss it. And it moves so quickly across the sky as well. You literally can't mistake it for anything else. But what I want to make sure is that, you know, young viewers especially do not confuse the International Space Station with Father Christmas's sleigh going overhead because it looks very convincing and, you know, young people could very easily be misled to believe that the International Space Station is Father Christmas. So I just want you all to be wary of that before we go into Christmas Eve and a probable International Space Station Passover. Then on the 26th of December on Boxing Day, there's going to be an annular solar eclipse. I'm not saying annual, I'm saying annular, <laughs> which essentially means that we're not going to have a full total block out of the sun. The moon will pass in front of the sun, but we'll still have a ring around the outside. And that's because the moon's orbit isn't perfectly circular. So sometimes it's further away from us and sometimes it's closer. So at the minute, the moon is further away from us. And so it isn't big enough in the sky to fully block the sun. And this is going to happen mostly across Asia. Again, I'll put a link in the description so you can see if it's going to be visible from wherever you are going to be on the 26th. Then something to look out for in the sort of betwixtmas period. So we're going to have a new moon on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. It's going to be a very, very dark Christmas night, but it does mean that by the 27th, 28th, 29th, we then have a very young moon rising in our sky. So a very, very thin crescent. Just after sunset, if you look towards the west, you should be able to see it and also spot Venus there at the same time. So on the 27th, the moon will just be below Venus and then by the 28th, it'll sort of be level with it. And then by the 29th, it will have risen above Venus at sunset. And it's just a really spectacular sight to look out for in the sort of winter sky. Then coming up next year, which I kind of can't believe that I can say that, but on the 4th of Jan, 2020, is the point at which the Earth is going to be closest to the Sun in its orbit. We call it its perihelion, so from the Greek, peri meaning close and helion meaning Sun, as in like Helios, the Sun God. And the reason I bring this up is just because for people who haven't sort of thought about it very carefully in a while, maybe, people often think that our summer should be when the Earth is closest to the Sun. But of course, January 4th, at least for the Northern Hemisphere, is the middle of winter. Yes, the Southern Hemisphere is in summer. But then of course, by the time we reach Aphelion, which is the point at which Earth is furthest from the Sun, it'll be Southern Hemisphere winter and Northern Hemisphere summer. So what that should make you realize is that, well, our position in terms of the distance we are from the sun actually has no bearing on our seasons at all. What actually causes the seasons is the Earth's axis tilt of about 23 degrees, which means that the northern hemisphere is pointing towards the sun in June and the southern hemisphere away from the sun. And then six months later, the southern hemisphere points towards the sun and the northern hemisphere points away from the sun. And that's what gives us the huge variations in temperature we get with our seasons and not the sort of differences in distance we get from the sun on the Earth's elliptical orbit. All right, that's enough of creating our necks and looking up. It's time to come back to Earth with a little bit of a bump and talk about all of the recent results that have come out from the past month from astronomy research. And personally, I'm excited because there's two different black hole results to report. And you know me, I love black holes. So the first result I want to talk about is about NGC 62 40. So this is a galaxy of hundreds of billions of stars. The NGC galaxies are basically a list of about 10,000 or so of the brightest galaxies in our sky. So they're pretty near to us as well because they're so bright. But this month, 
in this galaxy, astronomers found three supermassive black holes. Three. Now, NGC 6240, if you look at the image, it's very clearly what we call a train wreck merger. It's the merger of two galaxies, and it's absolutely destroyed the shape of the galaxy. You've got the gravitational forces have torn it apart and giving you these huge sort of tails of material and giving you this weird, weird shape. Now the thing is, when two galaxies merge, we also think that the supermassive black holes that are found in the centre of all galaxies, I've done a video on that if you're curious as to how we know that, that those black holes also merge as well. And we know of a fair few galaxies that have what we call a dual active nuclei, as in instead of just one very, very bright, energetic, actively accreting supermassive black hole in the centre, you've got two of them. I like to call them the double yokers, like a double yoker egg. But this study by Kalachny and collaborators found three supermassive black holes in the centre of NGC 6240. They're all over like 90 million times the mass of the sun, and they're found within a region of about 3,000 light years, which might sound a lot, but you've got to remember the galaxies are like hundreds of thousands of light years across. So the space that these black holes are found inside of is only about 1% of the entire galaxy's size. So they're crammed in there. Now the way that these were found were to use this sophisticated new instrument on the very large telescope, the VLT, in Chile that's called MUSE. And it's incredibly detailed. It can get the same level of detail from the ground as the Hubble Space Telescope can get from space, using this incredibly advanced system where it uses lasers to sort of determine what is the turbulence through the air as the light is coming to us, and then actually adapt for that and take it away from the light that we're seeing. It's so, so clever. That instead of just taking an image and having just sort of the amount of light received in each pixel, and every single pixel, it also splits that light into a spectrum. And then what you can see is the emission and absorption from all the different elements that are in that tiny part of the galaxy. But also you can see the movement of stuff as well, because if stuff is moving in the part of the galaxy, different parts of the spectrum will get slightly red shifted and blue shifted with respect to each other. So you can pick out what we call the kinematics of the galaxy. So combining that incredible super detail and then also the kinematics of the galaxy and all the stars and all the gas in it as well, they've been able to pick out where these three supermassive black holes are, literally from the gas that's orbiting around them and will eventually be accreted, sort of like, you know, gobbled up by each of these black holes. Now, okay, yeah, three supermassive black holes in a tiny space does sound cool by itself, but the reason that we care about this is just a picture of understanding galaxy evolution as a whole. So we know that mergers between galaxies happen because we see them all across the universe. But when we think about how galaxies and the black holes in the middle of them have managed to grow so big over the lifetime of the universe, sometimes when you think about it and you think about the most massive black holes, about sort of like, you know, 10 billion times the mass of the sun, you think even with sort of the maximum amount of mergers it was most likely to have had just from, you know, being close to other galaxies and the happenstance of another one passing by and it being able to merge, you often kind of come up with the conclusion, well, I don't think there was quite enough time for it to have grown that big. But that's only assuming that you have two galaxies merging at once. If you can have three galaxies merging at the same time, so that you end up with three supermassive black holes, then instead of doubling your mass, you can triple your mass. What's even more exciting is that obviously these supermassive black holes will also one day merge, and when they do, they'll give out gravitational waves. Now the current detectors we have on Earth, so LIGO and Virgo, are detecting mergers of black holes that are like 30 times the mass of the sun, instead of, you know, 90 million times the mass of the sun because the frequency that it's sensitive to is that sort of frequency range. It's not sensitive to the frequency of the gravitational waves that a supermassive black hole merger would give out. But there is a new instrument coming called LISA, which is supposed to be launched not next decade, but the decade after, so 2031, I think. And it's going to be a gravitational wave detector that is in space, which boggles my mind. Like, it's an engineering marvel that they can do that. And so LISA should be able to detect the mergers of supermassive black holes, and maybe one day we'll find 
the merger of three of them rather than just two. But it's unlikely that it's going to be NGC 6240 because, well, these black holes are still 3,000 light years away and so will probably take a couple of million years to actually merge. So I won't hold your breath with NGC 6240. So a year ago, in my Night Sky News for December 2018, we talked about how Voyager 2 had just left the solar system, which is kind of incredible, you know, having launched in the 70s, it's finally at the edge of the solar system. Now, it wasn't the first synthetic object to leave the solar system because Voyager 1 left in August 2012, but it was the first with two detectors on board that could actually tell us that it had left the solar system. So to be sure you've left the solar system, you need two things. You need a detector to detect the radiation from the sun, so the solar wind particles, the kind of particles that hit into our atmosphere, get funneled by magnetic fields and produce the northern lights. You can kind of think of them as like the sun's extended atmosphere. Then you also need a detector that can detect cosmic ray particles from interstellar space that come from supernova explosions and that are really quite harmful and dangerous radiation. And so you can think of both of those streams of particles as like a wind. And where those two winds of particles collide, you get an incredibly hot barrier of plasma, which is like a gas, but the electrons in all of the atoms are sort of free to roam around. And so what that then gives you is this sort of boundary. And it's a boundary we call the heliopause, literally helio, sun, pause, well, stop, right? And I should also say we like this plasma barrier of the heliopause because it stops 70% of the super harmful radiation of cosmic rays from interstellar space from actually making it into the solar system. And so what Voyager 2 was able to do was detect the drop-off in solar wind particles and the increase in cosmic ray particles as it crossed the heliopause. Now, Voyager 1 should have been able to do that, but it's detected to detect solar wind particles wasn't working at the time. And so we only got the increase in cosmic ray particles. We didn't get the decrease in solar radiation. So we couldn't actually do the science we wanted to on the heliopause without both of those things to detect what's going on. Now, the heliopause, though, it isn't, you know, some incredibly thin barrier where all of a sudden you take the switch. Voyager 2 took about a day to traverse across this sort of hot region of plasma where the two winds collided. And over the past year, the science team at NASA have been analyzing the results and last month published about five papers describing what they'd found. First of all, the temperature reached 31,000 centigrade or Celsius, which is like 89,000 Fahrenheit, which is just kind of a ridiculous temperature, right? For just the edge of the solar system. You associate the edge of the solar system with being very, very cold. But these are the kind of temperatures you can reach when these two streams of energetic particles collide. It suggests it's a much more violent process than anyone had ever considered. Also, this layer of plasma was thought to be a very smooth, homogeneous surface, you know, almost like the surface of a bubble. But in fact, what Voyager found was that it was kind of more like Swiss cheese. It was patchy, there was holes everywhere. So it was getting like spikes of cosmic rays as it was passing through all the patches in this heliopause. And now we think it's these patches that do allow sort of like 30% of the cosmic rays to actually make it into the solar system and even sometimes land on the detector of the image you're trying to take using a telescope up a mountain somewhere, which is really annoying because it sometimes wrecks your observation and gets in the way. But at the same time, you're also aware that you've detected like a particle from interstellar space from some supernova millions of years ago. And so as inconvenient as it is, Next time I think that happens and I'm using a telescope, all I'm gonna be thinking of is like, ugh, Swiss cheese heliopause, let that one through, damn it. <laughs> so the next result I wanna talk about is a really cool result, but it was one that was taken by the media and over sensationalized so much to the point of being wrong. So those who did see it may have seen a headline that said, the 70 solar mass black hole that shouldn't exist, which is just plain false and a claim that the paper never actually made. So this was a paper by Liu and collaborators and essentially what they found was a black hole in a binary system with a very large star. And they found it essentially by observing the motion of that star over a couple of years and seeing that the only way you could explain that motion was if it was orbiting around something very massive and using some nice orbital mechanics, you find out that that thing is 
68 times the mass of the sun um, because we actually can't see it and it's dark. The only thing it can be is a black hole, which is really cool. But why did it get so much attention? Well, this is the biggest stellar mass black hole, i.e. sort of the similar mass range as stars, that we've ever found direct evidence for. Note how careful I was with the wording there, because we've clearly found more massive black holes before, because we've got supermassive black holes that are tens of thousands to millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. And also we've detected gravitational waves from the mergers of two black holes that are around about 30 to 40 times the mass of the sun, meaning that the end product you get is around about 60 to 80 times the mass of the sun. So the black hole they've detected here at 68 times the mass of the sun fits sort of right in the middle of that. But it's one we've directly observed not just gravitational waves that we've detected and said, well, the product must be that mass. All the black holes we've detected directly before have been found using x-rays. They've been what's called an x-ray binary. So the material that's spiraling around the black hole that it's sort of accreting heats up to incredible, incredible temperatures and gives off x-rays. And usually they're found in a binary system with another star because the black hole is pulling material off the other star. Now those black holes we found are around 20 to 30 times the mass of the sun. So this one that they found is a little different being 70 times the mass of the sun, but it's not so different as to call for these headlines. So where did these come from? So if you consider like black hole formation 101, you have a star, a very massive one usually that's maybe something like a hundred or so times the mass of the sun, that's coming to the end of its life because it's running out of hydrogen to burn into helium or helium to burn into heavier and heavier elements. And what happens is that once there's no energy pushing outwards from those nuclear reactions, gravity basically collapses the whole thing inwards. But what does happen is that most of the outer layers of the star are then thrown back out again. They rebound and they're thrown back out in a big sort of what we call a supernova explosion. But then the central region of the star still does collapse down. So the biggest black hole you can kind of form in that way is about 20 or so times the mass of the sun, depending on sort of what generation your star is, like how many more heavier elements it does have in it. You can get sort of different amounts, but generally it's about 20 times the mass of the sun. So this is what we think forms these x-ray binaries because there's just two stars and one of them goes supernova, collapses down into a black hole and starts to accrete matter off the other one. And we're seeing sort of the fresh black hole that's just formed. But we know that's not the only way that you can make or grow a black hole. You can merge two black holes together and we know that that happens because you've detected gravitational waves from such a thing happening. So if we think about how something 68 times the mass of the sun could have formed, well, maybe it wasn't a binary system to start with. What if it was three stars orbiting each other, or four, or five, or even six? That might sound a little bit crazy, but actually only 50% of stars are single stars like our sun, at least sort of in our solar neighborhood anyway. Of the 3000 star systems nearest to us in the solar system, 50% sure are these single stars like the sun, but then 35% are binaries, 10% are tertiary systems, and even like 3% are four stars orbiting each other. And then the rest are even five or six stars orbiting each other. So it's not an unlikely scenario to get more than one star maybe going supernova and collapsing into a black hole, especially if maybe three or four of them are very massive stars. And you can see how something 68 times the mass of the sun might have ended up growing that big and ending up looking like it was just in a binary system. Also, back in 2015, the Hubble Space Telescope caught a star completely disappearing entirely. One day it was there, and the next it just wasn't. No supernova remnant, nothing to say that it exploded, absolutely nothing. It just completely collapsed down into being a black hole. This was the star N6946BH1. It was a 25 times the mass of the sun's star that essentially had tried to take the next step up from sort of burning hydrogen into helium and, and taking the step from going, okay, helium into carbon. But something had gone a little bit wrong. The pressures and densities weren't quite right to make that step up and so could not counteract all of a sudden the force of gravity pulling 
everything inwards into a black hole. So not only could you imagine a scenario where the system started off as maybe a tertiary or even four stars in a system, I mean five, six, whatever, and maybe they all collapsed down in a normal supernova to a black hole, or maybe some of them directly collapsed into a black hole. So it's not that it shouldn't exist at all. In fact, it's actually quite likely that it would exist. It's just that we've never seen anything like that before, but there was nothing to say that it shouldn't happen. Because we've observed all of those things individually, but never all in the same place. And that is what makes it exciting for me. So that's it for space news for December and for 2019 and for this decade as well. All that's left for me to say is to have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I will be taking a much needed break from both YouTube and research over Christmas and I'll be out for a couple of weeks, but I will be back in January 2020 with more videos and news like this one. I personally am incredibly excited for what 2020 and in fact just the 20s as a decade as a whole have in store. Hopefully that we'll see the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope and more and more exciting discoveries and new results in research. Who knows where the 2020s will take us, but wherever it does, I will be here explaining it all for you guys, my lovely subscribers. So until then, I will see you guys in the next decade. Now the way that these were found was to use the sophistic... Now the way that these were found was to use the sophistic... Sophisticated, come on. And it's gonna be a gravitational wave detector. Detector? Christmas is coming and back is getting fat. Please put a penny in the old black hole.